Thanks, all of you, for coming and sharing Saturday afternoons with us. We appreciate it very, very much. We've got an interesting seminar for you today. A few notes beforehand. I spent yesterday at a free market medical association conference in Dallas, which is a fantastic group of doctors and self-insured employers, everything, who are trying to create a cash medical system. And what was interesting about the conference is that the traditional medical system, cost-wise, is totally out of control. Uh, costs are going up 10% a year, completely unsustainable. And at this point, for a typical family of four, uh, their portion of their so-called health insurance, their employer's portion, plus the out-of-pocket deductible and co-pays is about $25,000 a year now, which is totally unsustainable. I can tell you from my own experience, my family of four spends far less than $25,000 a year on health care, uh, even at these inflated prices, which we suffer under today. So with the uh, U.S. population over 65 years of age set to double by 2060, that, those are the years when people tend to consume more health care services. So clearly, uh, that system is unsustainable. And the fact that we have now uh, probably really double-digit inflation is not helping matters, uh, to put it mildly. So when we talk about the aging of the U.S. population, some of you may know the name of an economist named Lawrence Kotlikoff. I've brought him up in some shows in the past. He's at Boston University. He's not an ideologue, not a libertarian free market guy necessarily, but a very good guy. And he has taken it upon himself to do some calculations about a, a statistic he calls the fiscal gap. The fiscal gap is basically when we think about all the outlays that Uncle Sam is likely to owe to these elderly people in the next 20, 40, 50 years in, in the form of Medicare and Social Security in particular, you know, what do those numbers look like versus what is the U.S. federal government likely, realistically, to bring in in tax revenue during that same period? So you take a discounted present value of those two numbers, and the outlays exceed the tax revenue coming in, in his calculation, by about $220 trillion, with a T, dollars. Okay, I don't know where $222 trillion comes from, but it doesn't come out of thin air. So, when we look at the $30 trillion, that number actually sounds good now, $30 trillion in U.S. debt, uh, what's enabled that debt to be serviceable by Congress, because every year Congress has to have a budget and spend money, and part of that expenditure is interest on all of that Treasury debt outstanding. And if you look at all that Treasury debt, and some of it is short term, some of it is longer term, if you take all that outstanding Treasury debt and you weight it by the amount of the underlying bond, and you say, what's the average interest rate that Uncle Sam's paying on all that debt? It turns out it's only about 1.5 or 1.6%. Okay, that's the interest rate that Congress has to wrestle with every, day, every year to service the outstanding federal debt. Okay, that's a pretty nice low number, to put it mildly. If that were simply to triple to 4.5% or 5%, which is far closer to historical averages of treasury debt, uh, in, uh, uh, treasury debt interest rates, you know, very quickly, that 500-something billion in Congress's budget would go to $1.5 trillion a year, which would be the single biggest item in the budget. It would be larger than so-called defense. It would be larger than Social Security, Medicare, et cetera. So Congress doesn't want that, to put it mildly. So, you know, we talk about all this, and it feels and seems unsustainable. It feels and seems like we're coming up against some sort of inflection point. But to be fair to our critics, uh, a lot of people who think like us have been saying this sort of thing for a long time, since 1971, as a matter of fact, and yet it has sustained itself somehow. And in, in large part, that is because uh, the U.S. dollar enjoys world's reserve currency status and also because there continues to be an active market for U.S. Treasury debt. Why that is, how that is, is a long, complicated question. You would think at some point people would say, I'm not going to loan money to this insane group of people anymore unless I get junk bond rates of 20% or something because they're insane and they'll never, ever, ever get the, their fiscal house in order. But nonetheless, we have our friends at the Fed there to say, hey, don't worry about it, Congress. If, if there's not a ready market for U.S. Treasury debt, we'll be there to come along and suck it up. So there's still a market for Treasuries and how long that lasts, I don't know. 
But the, the impetus behind the book that Dr. Murphy authored and that is really the subject of our talk today was that you know, there's so much money and debt out there floating and circulating that we've, we're almost starting to lose sense of what money is. We, conceptually, it's, it's almost getting difficult to grasp it because it's so enormous. You know, that we have all of this uh, sovereign debt, household debt, business debt, individual debt. We have so much um, spending by Congress that is deficit funded. We have all this fi fiduciary media out there, non-banked or excuse me, non-backed money substitutes. We have all of these derivatives and exotic financial instruments, which are hard to track and understand. Uh, and of course, you know, we have interest rates that are, have become a policy tool for the Federal Reserve. In other words, interest rates are something that government uses as a policy rather than something that the marketplace determines as an exchange ratio between people's desire to borrow money and people's desire to save money. So everything seems almost surreal, and it, you know, even our, our critics, of course, poo-poo this and say it doesn't matter and that we can have deficit spending forever, and, and some of those critics are on the right, people like Dick Cheney, for example, who said deficits don't matter. A and even some of our friends, let's say in the Bitcoin community, I think have added to this obfuscation when they talk about, well, you know, Bitcoin money is an energy system or it's an information system, and we've gotten away from any conception of what uh, certainly Mises and Menger and other great economists understood as money as arising from a commodity. So uh, when Bob Murphy and I started discussing this book project, we thought we really need a book that will get into the mechanics and the basics of all this, because there's actually a Fed publication, which is now out of print, called Understanding Money Mechanics. And it's, it's pretty dry, it's pretty technical, but it, it addresses almost the plumbing of the money system, how money's created, how does the Federal Reserve interact with the Treasury, how does the Treasury interact with Congress, how do they all interact with the so-called primary dealer banks and then the commercial banks. So how does all this money and debt and government bonds get created? And so that's always been a criticism of more theoretical economists, particularly Austrians, is that, well, you guys live in this nice world of theory and it would be great if money worked that way, but you don't really understand how money actually works in the real world, in the banking system. And I said, Bob, we need a book to disabuse people of this. And so the book that Bob created as a serialized uh, set of articles on Mises.org, it goes at first through the actual origins and history of money itself, which is very valuable to anybody. Uh, it goes through how gold uh, and other commodities arose as money and talks about the gold standard, the classical gold standard, and of course what happens to it. Uh, it talks a lot about the history and development of central banks. Uh, the history of the U.S. dollar, particularly the, the development of that with the Bretton Woods Agreement in the 20th century, and then, of course, Nixon's actions in 1971, uh, and the shock there. It talks a lot about uh, the, the uh, various crises that the dollars had, the, uh, the 2007 crisis, of course, Bob has a, has a particular section in the book about what then developed what we now call extraordinary monetary policy of, of asset purchasing by the central bank. Uh, it talks about all of these uh, financial intermediaries that we call shadow banking. So that sounds interesting, right? But shadow banking is actually, in many ways, a very frightening thing because there are institutions which don't take deposits but nonetheless create credit. And uh, the, the left doesn't like them so much because they're unregulated. Uh, we don't like them so much because we don't know how much um, you know, debt and money they're creating out of thin air and whether that's gonna be weaponized against us. So when we think about shadow banking, we think of, it sounds nefarious, like uh, some brilliant quant kid at Goldman Sachs is coming up with some scheme to enrich him and his partners, something like that. But it's actually, it's not that shadowy at all. Quicken Loans, Rocket Mortgage, Quicken Loans owns Rocket Mortgage. That's the biggest shadow banking institution in the world. They create billions and billions and billions of dollars of mortgage debt, and they do it almost every day. And of course, uh, Bob's book contains a section on cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. So it really is a, a fantastic up-to-date survey of money uh, and everything that uh, I think a lay person would need to know about it. And I used to tell people, if they read that little pamphlet by Murray Rothbard, What Has Government Done to Our Money? I think it's about 
88 pages or so, depending on the size of the print. And I think we have some here. Uh, it's just a fantastic book, especially for people who might be younger or people who are really, you know, haven't thought or read much about this. It's a, it's a great gift for people. And I, I always used to say, you know, if you just read that book, if you spend two hours, you'll know more than, you know, 95% of people out there walking around about money. And I think Bob's book, in, in the very same vein, you can't read it in two hours. It's a little longer than that. But nonetheless, if you just consume Bob's book, and that's all you consume, you will know more about money than virtually, than m most economists, actually, to be frank. So I think it, it was a fantastic book. I'm very pleased with the way uh, it came out serially and the way it worked out, uh, the, the organization of it, the chapters, uh, the way it works conceptually, I think it's very clear, and uh, I think it's a real feather in Bob's cap that he was able to produce this in a, in a, in a style and a format uh, that's very accessible for lay readers. So I'm excited to hear him uh, talk a little bit about what's going on with money and markets today. But first, uh, we have a great panel for you of some of our senior fellows and some of our uh, former summer fellows. Uh, who are all working in the money space in one way or another, either in the crypto industry, uh, in the think tank industry as, as a professor. And so I'll ask uh, Tho Bishop to come up and introduce them. So please, a round of applause for Tho.